inspiring focus and collective action on what's most important. Like to me, that's, that's what leadership is. You're watching Young and Profiting Podcast on YouTube. Welcome to the show. I'm your host, Hala Taha, and on Young and Profiting Podcast, we investigate a new topic each week and interview some of the brightest minds in the world. Before we get started, hit the subscribe button and don't forget to click the bell icon to be notified every time we drop a new video. Hi, Peter. So happy to have you here on Young and Profiting Podcast. So nice to be with you. Thanks for having me. Me too. I'm super excited for this conversation. I think that my audience is going to love these topics about leadership, time management, getting people to change. You are the author of 18 books and you are also a very famous executive coach and consultant, one of the best in the world. I know that everybody has a come up story. Everybody has a journey and it's not like this all happened overnight. So I'd love for you to walk us through your career journey. I know that you started your company in 1998 in a one bedroom apartment, fifth floor walk up, and it wasn't very easy, you know? So walk us up until that point and then let's talk about you launching your company. Sure, and just to be clear, I, I've actually written five books but I've contributed to 16 others. Oh, so gotcha, it's, gotcha. It's kind of like written or contributed to, but. Um, so uh, let's see how far back to go. I guess you just reminded me of my apartment, uh, my fifth floor walk up <laughs> apartment. And I spent basically all of the money that I had at that point on a laptop, which cost $5,000 for a, uh, for a 10 inch screen black and white laptop. It was a Hitachi, I remember still. I don't know why I remember these details. Um, uh, I, I started my career leading expeditions, mountaineering and kayaking and teaching leadership on expeditions. I sort of, when I was in college, I fell in love with the outdoors and with moving with groups of people from point A to point B. I didn't know how to do it. I grew up like you know, a Jewish kid from New York City. So like I, I had never camped before in my life. Um, and uh, and I really fell in love with working with people in, in, you know, kind of really, I mean, everything you need to know about leadership and team stuff, you can learn on a camping trip because you're, you know, you have to get along with everybody else. You have to get from point A to point B. You have to survive and maybe even thrive and have a lot of fun. And so I did that for a while and I really, really loved it. And then though realized that if my intentions were to have a family and have kids and that I probably couldn't just like live in the woods and do that in the way that I had wanted to or expected to do it. So I, I remember a very, very intentional decision, which was I don't want to suddenly have to make a bunch of money and then go do work I don't particularly love or want to do in order to make money. So right now I'm still whatever, 22, 23. I'm going to move two degrees over. Like I'm going to do what I'm doing, but I'm going to do it in a way that could begin to start to make money for me so that I could keep doing the stuff that I loved with an eye towards how do I do this and make money? And even if I don't make money at the beginning, that's okay because as long as I kind of keep moving in that direction, eventually I'll end up loving what I do and making money at the same time. And that's sort of how it turned out. So I remember that very intentional decision. And then I started a company teaching leadership to organizations um, using the outdoors as the metaphor. So, you know, doing team building stuff and things like that. And I really loved that. I made probably about $20,000 a year as I was doing that. You know, like it wasn't <laughs> like my big money maker, but I learned a ton. And I did uh, one project that I worked on was with a company called The Hay Group, which was a terrific uh, consulting firm. And we together did something like amazing. It, it had to do with, well, there's specifics to it. It's not so important, but it was what, what's important is it was working with an organization that was in the midst of a lot of conflict. And we did like something that blew us all out of the water in terms of what we accomplished. And they asked me to join them and start a practice with several other consultants on transformational change in organizations. So uh, I did that. I felt like I, 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 you know, was enjoying the work that I was doing in my own company, but I had hit the ceiling of what I knew and how to grow, which was by the way, a very low ceiling. It was like, you know, <laughs> like a, yeah, a very low ceiling. <laughs> And, um, and so I joined this consulting firm and I learned a ton with them. I worked with tremendously capable, smart, generous people. 
Um, I did uh, an executive MBA while uh, while I was there, so I got my MBA, and and then I uh, and and that was really my big education in business. I mean, I learned a ton about how it worked. In fact, I remember my my boss at the time, Andy Geller, who you know ran the Hay Group in New York, and he. This will tell you a lot, actually, both about our relationship. And, but he, he, I had written a letter, a business letter, and, and he um, called me into his office and he sat me down across from him, across this big desk, right? This big sort of daunting desk. And he said, there are, Peter, I, I read this letter. There's a whole bunch of issues here. And, and he started talking about the letter and everything from like, you used a comma. After Dear John, you used a comma instead of a colon. That's not how you do it. So I was sitting in this chair that happened to have wheels on the bottom. And so without getting up, I just pushed myself. I used my feet to push myself backwards and around to get to his side of the desk because I couldn't see what he was talking about. And he said, hold on, stop. You're not getting it. I am... I'm upset. I'm pulling my authority on you. I'm sitting across from this desk and I want you to, and I said, hold on, Andy, do you want me to learn something or just feel shame about the letter? Because this will work if you want me to just feel shame about the letter. But if you want me to learn something, then we should both look at the letter and you should show me what you're doing so that I can learn it. And, and kudos to him where he was like, okay, actually, I want you to learn something. So come over to my side of the desk and we'll work <laughs> on it. <laughs> but, uh, but I really, I learned, I learned a lot. And, and then I spent a year at Accenture. And when I was at Accenture, I came up with an idea for, and I've started about three companies. And every time I've started a company, it's because of some frustration that I've had with the way things are being done. And I think, I have an eye towards a, a better way to do it. And it happened when I, was, I actually worked with Outward Bound and with Knowles, and I, I, I kind of wanted to do the corporate programs in a different way. And they didn't really want to change what they were doing. And then I started off and, and started my own company there. And, uh, and then this time I was at Accenture and I felt like, you know, the way we're consulting, we're indispensable to our clients because we're doing the work for them. But that means that we're not teaching them how to do it. That means that they're dependent on us, not independently capable. And it's all these things that I don't believe in. Like I believe that if I'm gonna help someone do something, I want them to learn how to do it. I don't think I need to force them to need me. Mm -hmm. I feel like, you know, if I've got a good relationship with them and I'm helpful to them, then I'll be useful to them, increasingly complex, interesting problems, and I will continue to be of value. But I wanna teach them how to do what I'm doing. I don't wanna just do it myself for them. Mm -hmm. And so I started, I created a whole business model for it around coaching. And this was at the very early days of coaching. This was in 97. Mm -hmm. And it was about coaching, really kind of helping people to develop their own independent capability and ownership. And, and uh, I presented it to them with a little bit of um, not hubris, but but a sense of of ownership over it myself and a sense of the value of it. And I basically said, look, I've got this business idea. I'm very happy to do it here. If we do it here, it solves a bunch of problems that you're having. It doesn't have to be the whole company, but it solves a bunch of problems you're having. And, and I pointed out what those were, and it allows us to develop very senior level relationship with the clients. And this is what it looks like. But in order to do it, and I'm happy to lead it, but in order to do it, I, I want to lead it because I have a real sense and I've written all these business plans and everything for it. And you have to make me a partner. And, and you know, and I, I want a percentage of what I'm creating but I, I'm happy to create it here. And this is what it'll look like. And this is how much money it'll make. And they said, and I think I was, how old was I? This was in 97 and I was born in 67. So I was 30 years old. And, and they said, thank you very much, but we really prefer you to be a manager and you're not ready to be a partner. And you know, we don't promote people like that just cause they have ideas. And so I said, okay. And then a couple of weeks later I gave notice cause I decided, all right, I'll just start this myself. And then about a week and a half or two weeks before I left, they, they said to me, okay, hold on. Actually, you're apparently serious that you're going to leave. And so we are open to having this conversation of what this could look like. And at that point I was already gone in my head. I was already, mm -hmm. I had, you know, like I had taken the risk that I needed to take. So I said, you know, I really, really appreciate that. And it's a nice vote of confidence, but, uh, but I'm going to just start this on my own. 
Are you, and, wait, can I just ask you a question? No, are you please, happy I'm that- I'm sorry, I'm just like, I'm doing happy? everything my media person told me never to do. Like, talk for 30 <laughs> seconds, don't. But anyway, no, sorry. No, well, tell me about that decision, you know, do you regret not going with Eccentric? Do you think that it would have grew faster or bigger had you gone with Eccentric? Or are you just really happy you went out on your own? Yeah, I mean, the, you're asking great questions and they're two mutually exclusive questions. So, so I'll answer them each separately, which is, I, I don't regret it for a second. Um, I so deeply value the freedom I have to do things the way I want to do them. My entire career has been deeply unstrategic. I, I, I haven't had like this view of here's what I'm going to create. I keep um, Frederick Beekner, who is this theologian, wrote this beautiful, uh, he had this beautiful quote which said that your vocation, and I even think of it as calling, mm -hmm. but like your vocation is the place at which your greatest joy meets the world's greatest need. And I am constantly I looking that. to perfect that intersection. And so I've changed, I've run been running my company for, you know, close to 25 years and I've changed it four or five times because I keep, because first of all, I change as a person and the market changes. And also like I keep learning more about myself and I keep wanting to refine that intersection of my greatest joy and the world's greatest need. I can't do that at a place like Accenture, which is great at what they do. And I learned a ton being there, but I don't, I don't have the freedom. So I don't regret it for a second. Would I have grown faster? Might I have made a lot more money? Might I have made a larger impact? Probably, I don't know for sure. Like I, I often think, you know, I might have because of those resources and the support and that stuff, but also I, I would not have had, like I, I might not have been as effective in that environment because it's a much more corporate, you know, defined, uh, boundaried environment. And, you know, I'll tell you, like I made my numbers, every, like I had this crazy spreadsheet. And when I first started the company, it, the, the numbers reflected the spreadsheet almost to a T, like a million and a half, well, half a million in the first year, a million and a half in the second year, five million in the third year. I mean, it was like stupid projections and I made them every year, but in totally different ways than I had planned to. Hmm. Like not at all the ways that I would planned to because I'm opportunistic and I'm, you know, I don't know that I could have been opportunistic in that way. Like yeah. I, I don't like my plan wasn't working. So I did something else that was sort of in line. It's just not directly what I wrote in the business plan. So I don't regret it for a second. I think the biggest lesson for me in this, and I'm very, I, I had a very similar path where I started as an entrepreneur. You did have that, you know, outdoors job that you were, outdoors leadership job that you were talking about. But then you quickly went to entrepreneurship, then you went into corporate and learned some institutional knowledge and you came out and you started your own thing. And that's so powerful. People feel embarrassed about that. They think they, they're an entrepreneur and then you have to be an entrepreneur forever or you fail. But sometimes getting that institutional knowledge and learning how a huge company works and what the processes are and what organizational structure and culture is can be really powerful. Wouldn't you agree? Oh my God, a hundred percent. I could not do what I do without having that experience. I mean, I, I worked, I was deeply embedded in some very, very big complex organizations and there's no question. And, and with, with people who were embedded in them, with people for whom like that was a job with big, massive companies and corporations. So like, could I coach the president of Citibank if I hadn't had that experience? It would be hard. I mean, I'm not saying you can't do it, but it would be hard. You know, could I coach the CEO of CBS? Could I like, these are big, massive, you know, complex organizations. And, and the answer is like, like the, the, like what I learned in, you know, being in the, in these corporate environments are, is, is, you know, like was absolutely essential to what I do now, even though like, you know, I'm in a t-shirt and I get to do what I want now, but it, but you know, I, I learned so much by being in that, in that, in that. Yeah, setting. I can, I can totally relate to that. So yeah. let's talk about the dot com crash because your business was doing great. And then it, you kind of just lost everything like a lot of other business owners did. And right. then you did some soul searching. You know, you almost went to rabbi school. You almost went to med school. You took acting classes and started an investment fund. These are all very different things. So talk to us about why you did that and what you learned from that experience. 
Um, yeah, it, I did a lot. I mean, the interesting thing about that time period, which was, you know, we, we crashed along with everyone else, but I am not a huge risk taker. And so I built the company in a way where we remained profitable every year. Like we, we weren't nearly as big as we were beforehand, but we never, like, I didn't have a lot of capital expenses. I, I never believe, and 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 ask the question you asked before, which is, had you invested more money in infrastructure of the company, you know, would you be bigger now? Probably, like probably, but I would have been super stressed. Like those years would have been <laughs> super stressful for me. But instead I was like, okay, I'm gonna shrink the company because I can, and, and, and now I'm not gonna lose money, but mm -hmm. I also have a lot more time on my hands and what am I gonna do and how am I gonna do it? And I, um, it was, you know, I, it was a great, there's a way in which it was a great time. Uh, and, and the reason is because I've always thought about being a rabbi. I really like acting. Like all of these things are really interesting to me. Mm -hmm. And so I pursued them in a certain way. And what ended up happening is I, I realized I do all of those things in my work. Like I am, I am like to this day, I'm a rabbi in my coaching. I'm not using Jewish text to, you know, bring to bear. I'm not, but you know, that I, I lead ritual. I can, I, I, I'm pastoral. I, you know, like I'm, I, I use those skills in the work that I do. I also use acting skills in the work that I do. Like, you know, when I'm doing speeches and when I'm, mm -hmm. you know, like, and so I realized like there are things I like about all of these things and I can actually incorporate, you know, this is again, that intersection, Frederick Buechner of my greatest joy in the world's greatest need. I can incorporate these things that attract me and I can incorporate them into the work that I'm currently doing and I will be better for it and my work will be better for it, but I don't have to like run off and join an ashram, you know, in India for, for six years or, you know, go to rabbinical school for, for, you know, four years and then, you know, and probably, by the way, I wouldn't be successful in any of those things and I would end up frustrated. Like if I went to rabbinical school and then I ended up in a congregation and suddenly I'm running a, a leading a congregation and there's things I would love about it, but I would feel all the constriction I felt at Accenture. I'd be in a box. I'd have to satisfy people in a certain way. I couldn't just pursue things that I wanted to pursue. And so, uh, so it was great to, ex to explore parts of myself that I really want to integrate mm -hmm. into the work that I do and then say, okay, well, how can I do that? I mean, my books are preaching, you know, preaching in some way, but with some practical approach to saying, oh, by the way, and here's how to put this to use in your own life, which, you know, is I think the best way to preach. So yeah. Cool. Uh, yeah. yeah I, I, I think that's awesome. You know, doing what you love, finding out the greatest need in the world that intersects with your joy. I think that is brilliant. Let's go into the meat and potatoes of your work. I want to talk about leadership. I want to talk about time management, getting people to change your new book coming out this week. Um, so let's talk about time management. You have a very popular book called 18 Minutes. And you uncover this 18 minute approach to help us better prioritize our lives. So give us the highlight reel of that book. What is a, what is the 18 minute approach? Okay. So the highlight reel is the biggest myth in time management is you can get it all done. You know, if only you have the right system or use the right labels or organize yourself, if only you were just like a little better than you are now, you can get it all done. And that is a complete and total misconception. Like you cannot get it all done. You are a limited resource. And, you know, first of all, you're a limited resource. And this is the motivational part of this interview because you're going to die, right? Like eventually, like we're all going to die. And at that point, we will stop being productive, right? And, and for most of us, we're going to become less productive way before that, hopefully. And, and you know, there's only a limited amount of stuff we could do. So, you know, it's like uh, one of my clients in, in, in his work ended up getting a, uh, f in fact, I was just on the phone with a, a, a separate client that I was just thinking of who just basically got a role that's four times as big as the role he had beforehand. So the question is, okay, 
So does that, that means four times as many emails. That means four times as many meetings. That means, so are you going to work four times as hard? You were already CEO of a company. Are you going to like, you know, no, of course not. So we have to make different kinds of choices. We have to decide what we're going to do. And most importantly, what we're not going to do. We have to be really deliberate. And this is what's great about being a limited resource. It forces us to be strategic and intentional about what we're going to do and what we're not going to do. So to admit to ourselves, I will not get it all done. Now I have to choose. How do I choose what to do? And we choose it based on, you know, what is most important for me to achieve over the next year? And how does that translate to this week? And how does that translate to this day? One of the things that I teach in this book is your to-do list is an intake document. It is not an action document, right? Mm -hmm. Because your to-do list is too long and you're not going to get everything done. But your calendar, your calendar is, is time limited. You've got what, however many hours you're going to choose to work in a day, it's time limited. And so now you can make choices about, well, I've got three hours, you know? And when you look at all the meetings you have and et cetera, you might say, well, I've got 45 minutes in my day. So I've got to ask myself two questions. One, is there anything else in my day that is not so important to me that I should cancel in order to do other things that are on my to-do list? And if the answer is no, then you have to look at that to-do list and you have to say, what's the most important 45 minutes I have on here? And, and so, it, so the book is about how to make those kinds of decisions and how to be strategic and intentional about how we're spending our time and effectively our lives. Um, from my understanding in the book, you talk about five things per year that you should do and you say you shouldn't do more than those five things. So why is that? Why only pick five? And then how do you pick those five things? So part of that, like my career, is opportunistic and not at all strategic. Like, I, I, you know, like I, I tried it with eight. It didn't work. I tried it with two. I felt like I could do more. So I ended mm -hmm. up with five. And what I do is I talk about a six box to do list. So I take a piece of paper and I make like an elongated tic-tac-toe board, a line down the middle and then a line about two thirds of the way up and a line about one third of the way up. So now I've created six boxes. Right. And the bottom right box, I put everything else. I just put the title, everything else. And in the top five boxes, I put what are the five most important things I want to focus on this year. You know, like one might be my new book that's coming out, right? One might be my current client work. One might be bringing in new clients, right? That's already three things of my five things. Um, I'm, I'm not going to just do one of those. I'm going to do excellent work with my current clients. I'm going to do excellent work, like trying to find new clients and developing relationships and et cetera. I want to do my book. And... And then what I suggest is that you put every to do that you have to put, you put in one of those boxes. And if it doesn't fit in one of those boxes, like I'm, I'll just take my top three right now, which is do excellent work with my clients, bring in new clients and develop new relationships and work on the book. If there's a to do that doesn't fit into one of those, like buy running sneakers or uh, uh, I don't know, um, write a fiction book. If it doesn't fit in one of those things, I put it in the category of everything else, right? Because I've decided that that's less important. When I first started keeping a to-do list like this, 90% of what I had fit into the box of everything else. Because I'm like spending my time feeling incredibly productive, but getting nothing important done, which we do all the time. I mean, 90% of your email should be in that bottom right box, right? 90% of the things that you respond to or react to should be in that bottom right box. 90% of like the annoying conversations that go on in your head about how should I have responded to that? Or I can't believe they did that. Could you believe it? Let me call my friend and go, can you believe they did that? I mean, how am I like that goes in that bottom right box. That is not a good use of your time. <laughs> and so once you start doing that, now you're making choices that says, well, I'm going to spend a much larger majority of my time on the things that bring value to me and the world. I love that. So so let's dig deeper on focus. Let's talk about distractions. So you talk about unproductive versus productive distractions. Could you talk to us about that and how we can swap one for the other? Yeah. So um, uh, an unproductive distraction. First of all, there's a ton of research. I'm not going to call it to mind exactly. I'm not going to remember, but it like we get interrupted, you know, five or six times an hour and it takes us 20 or 30 minutes to get back to the work we were doing beforehand. And, and I'll tell you anecdotally, the more important your work and the harder it is, 
the more often you'll get distracted and the heart and the longer it will take you to get back to it because we're looking for those distractions because like it's hard work. If I'm working on a hard piece of writing or a challenging email or a strategic thought and like, I don't know, my dog calls, I'm going to answer <laughs> because it's going to like help me, you know, not do the hard work. It's going to help me get away from it. So we distract ourselves. Now, there are times when it's really useful to um, to, to clear your head, to separate yourself from what you're doing so that you can be 100 percent focused on the thing you're doing when you're actually doing it. So, you know, I um, I, I find that uh, like especially during covid, I've lived out in, you know, we have a house upstate New York and I've I've spent a lot of time upstate New York. I love going out and taking walks outside. It's when I'm in New York City, it's a little less so it's a little, you know, but I'm close to the park. So I'll do that. Um, but I also do this thing, which I call a productive distraction, which is I interrupt myself at least once an hour and I will stop at once an hour and I will ask myself, am I doing what I most need to be doing right now? And am I being who I most want to be right now? And I find that stopping myself and asking those questions keep, cause it's so, you know, like. I could be working on something like you, like I said, like I could be working on something really hard and really productive. And then, you know, somebody sends me an email, it pops up, I look at it, it sends me to a video of like a YouTube kitten. And like, you know, 45 minutes later, my phone rings, you know, my alarm rings and I'm saying, am I doing what I most need to be doing right now? And I find, what am I doing? Like, I'm still looking at videos of kittens or I'm on Mac rumors, figuring out like when the new laptop's gonna come out or like, any number of things I do that I find more fun than, you know, hard work that I have to do. And that just brings me back to focus and goes, okay, I'm definitely not doing what I need to be doing right now. And that's fine, but I'm going to shut this down and I'm going to go back to the work that I need to do. That's really good advice. I, I love that little tip. Let's talk about organizational focus because we've been talking about individual focus. And from my understanding, there's some nuances when it comes to organizational focus. And I own a business. I have 63 employees and it's very hard to align on priorities and get everybody on the same page. And you do this for a living. So what's your best advice for that? Well, you know, you're first of all, congratulations, because 63 employees, that's a that's a lot. I'm glad I don't have 63 employees, <laughs> um, but, I, but I but I, you know, admire you for it because I don't think I'm very good at that, uh, even though like I coach CEOs and but I, I still don't think I'm very good at it. I mean, I'm good at coaching it. I'm good at teaching it. But but it's 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 different. Um, uh, so so here's the thing, like the most important thing you already described it is how do you get people aligned? Right. That is the most important thing. And I talk about this in, in my book, Leading with Emotional Courage. So, you know, the, the, the first thing that I do with people often is, and I would do with you, is to say, what is the most important thing for you to achieve over the next 12 months? For you as an organization to think and be really, really clear. Like you could have strategic plans and you could have tactical approaches and you can have all the things. But what is the most important thing that you can describe in a sentence? What is the most important thing to achieve over the next 12 months? And along with that, what are the most important couple of behaviors that I want us to demonstrate as an organization, as a group of people working together? Like, what do I want? How do I want us to show up in order to achieve this most important thing? So that's step one. Step two is to then say for everybody, like everybody organizationally should be saying, what is my key contribution to making this most important thing happen. Everybody will have a key contribution. So you're very clear about what's the most important thing. I call that your big arrow. What is your big arrow? And, and big arrow outcome and big arrow behaviors. And then the second is, you know, what am I, uh, what is my key contribution to making that happen? And, and then what I often suggest is you give the most critical key contributors, you give them resources, you figure out based on, you know, like when people choose coaching, they'll often say, oh, this person has a listening problem, let's give them a coach. That's not how I coach. Like I, I don't, I find that, I mean, it's fine, but I think it's much more effective to identify who your key people are that are gonna drive your key initiatives forward and give them the coaching whether you think they need it or not. Because if you can amplify their performance by even 5% 
And coaching works really well, so it will amplify their performance more. But if you can amplify their performance 5%, you're going to do a lot to driving your your, uh, organization forward. Because the goal is for individuals to improve in a way that moves the organization forward. Not just, you know, it's not life coaching. It's like, you know, executive coaching to coach people to be more successful at driving something home. Of course, it works on individual issues also, but there's a context to it. And that context is really important. And then I would also collect data about what's what's getting in their way. Who are my most important key contributors and what's getting in their way? But that alignment piece is really, really critical. Okay, so one big arrow, cross department. And you've got to identify who your main contributors are and everybody in the organization, no matter how high up or low up on the totem pole, has to know how they're contributing. Now, what if you have more than one priority? What if you have three, four or five priorities or or do you only really want to communicate just one? Yeah. So I had someone say, look, we uh, Peter, I totally agree with you. I totally agree with you. This is really, really important. And we find like really keeping people focused on priorities is really important. And that's why we have 23 priorities. (laughs) And I said, I said, that's great. But you have defined the definition of priority. You know, like so what I would say is the big arrow is not the only thing you need to do. But be clear about what the most important thing is you need to do. And I would not say there are, you know, five most important things for you to do. So so there is there there might be five very important things for you to do. But here's what happens. What happens is people start to move in all sorts of directions. So let's say you've got 63 people and everybody and you say, okay, I've got 63 people and I've got five top areas of focus, which we've talked about, five priorities. I'm not going to choose between them to say what's most important, five things. So they say, okay, that's great. So there's five things that are most important. So now let's say, just to keep the math simple, there are 12 people who focus on each one of those priorities, right? But now you of the 12 people that are focusing on that priority, the other three people could do whatever they want to do. I, I, I'm, I'm kind of trying to do the math in my head here. But, you know, of the, so, so that means that there's 51 people who are not working on one of those priorities, but they kind of maybe have to. Right. Because that priority is overlapping because the priorities are, not you know, you don't have five different companies. You have, you know, five different priorities that the company's working on. And so now you have the potential of a lot of people making their own individual choices about what's important, what's not important, working across cross purposes to each other, because you might say that's your number one priority. And I'm like, thanks, I know. And you need my help. But that's not my number one priority. My number one priority is other things. So I'm not going to give you the time of day right now because mm-hmm. my bonus is based on this. other thing. I'm going to focus on that. And even even with very, very big companies, that coherence becomes even more important. And so I'm not saying give up on four of your five things. I'm not saying that. But identify what is most clear that everybody needs to make sure happens and let that be on everyone's plate. And other things can be on other people's plates also. And you can say these things are also important. I'm not giving up and we're going to measure them and have milestones and compensate around them or however you want to approach it. But make sure you have this one focus that everybody knows this is what's most important for us. Yeah, I think that's really great advice because then you have everybody focused on one common goal. To your point, everyone's prioritizing in the same way and more aligned and there's no like inner conflict with what people should be working on. So how descriptive should we get with that big arrow goal? Is that something that you suggest that we kind of break down into pillars or is it just should it be more vague? Like how descriptive do we get? Okay, so I'll say two things about it. One is that it's excuse me, it's um, it's not a monetary goal, right? So you don't want your big hour to say, okay, we're going to hit 5 million in revenue or a billion in revenue. Um, that tends to create, like that tends not to create coherence because everyone's going to try to figure out how to get there. You know, one company we we're working with, with that, and, and this is how I learned it because I made this mistake. You know, we said, okay, it's a financial services company and the goal was 2 billion in new assets coming into the company. Great. So now you had some people going after big banks to try to get it. You had other people going into mom and pop investment shops and everybody was like all over 
trying to make this two billion number and there was no coherence to their approach, which means that you couldn't leverage research and you couldn't leverage conversations and all this stuff. And so we came back together and we go, okay, this didn't work. You know, just saying a two billion in assets under management, new, new assets under management isn't enough. What we need to know is what is your strategy for getting there? What is your approach? How are you gonna approach it? So, so then they refined it and they said, okay, we're going to get two billion in assets, but we feel like we've tapped out the big investment houses. So we're gonna do that by approaching, you know, investment houses of such and such a size mm -hmm. and being a, you know, being a support to them and et cetera. So great, now we have a strategy, now we know it. Then they started getting traction. So it's like a mission statement for the year. We're going to do yeah. this by doing that. Yeah, it's a strategy. Like, here's our strategic approach to getting to the, the number could be a target, right? The two billion could be a target of the big arrow. But the big arrow is what are we prioritizing this year in order to get to that target? OK, well, I, I don't know. I'm super interested in this. So sorry for so many questions on the same topic. No, but, not at all. but so with this big arrow goal. Um, like for, I'll just use my company, for example, we're a marketing company and a podcast production agency. So ongoingly, I obviously want to grow the business. I want to increase client satisfaction. I want to retain my employees. But to me, those are like ongoing priorities and wouldn't right. be my big goal. We're launching a podcast network. So should I make something like that our big goal? The fact that it's new, it's innovative, it's something new that we want to launch. And then everything else is... Like I said, it needs to happen, but I right. don't want everyone to just focus on on the things that need to happen anyway. hundred percent. You're thinking about it in the right way. OK, cool. Yeah. All right. Let's move on to leadership. So what is your personal definition of leadership? Technically, it's just to have followers, but that's not really my definition of leadership. It's an interesting question and everybody sort of looks at it in different ways. You know, for me, it's inspiring focus and collective action on what's most important. Like to me, that's that's what leadership is when I think. And by the way, that's um, a sibling to my definition of coaching, which is a reliable process that helps clients get massive traction on their most important work. So I consider a great leader to be someone who's able to get massive traction on their most important work. But you're never but you're doing it through you know, an inspired people in a sense. OK, so let's talk about the leadership gap. You say that leaders never fail because they don't know something. Leaders fail because they don't close the gap between what they do and what they know. So what is this leadership gap? Can you tell us more about it? Yeah. And it's it's this is true for leaders. And it is also true for people like we all know more than we do. Like if we did everything we knew, we would all be the perfect weight. We would all be, you know, like we would all ha like we would all be the perfect spouses or partners like like we all know. I, I know what I need to do in my relationships. But in the moment, I might get triggered and I might not. I know how to be an amazing parent. Right. But when, you know, my son asks me for the fifth time why he can't do something that I've already told him five times and that he can't do. And I've explained it to him the first four. Like I lose my cool a little bit. I'm not proud of that. But there's a gap between what I know and what I do. Mm -hmm. And I'm constantly trying to trying to close that gap. But um but the challenge of that gap, and this is what the, you know, I, I mentioned this book beforehand, but leading with emotional courage is, is emotional courage. So think about, and, and let's just do a thought experiment now. Think about a difficult conversation, Hala, that you're not having, right? Think about a difficult, you're not going to have to say it out loud, but think about a difficult conversation that you know you should have, but you're not having. Okay. And, and listeners do, do the same thing. Don't just put this all on Hala. Like think of a difficult conversation that you're not having. Now, think for a moment about why you're not having it, right? I bet you know everything you need to know to have it. Mm -hmm. I bet you're per I know you're perfect. I know from this conversation, you're perfectly skilled enough to have a difficult conversation, right? And I bet you've had time and opportunity. So those are the things we usually try to solve for when we're trying to get something done. We do time management. I mean, the whole first part of this conversation was about time management, right? Time management. We talk about, you know, how do I build my skills in organizations? We do this all the time. We do training programs and communication plans. But in the end, the reason you're not having that conversation yet is because there's something you don't want to feel. 
Hmm. So, you mm-hmm. know, if you have that conversation, you might have to feel uncomfortable. You might have to feel that you're hurting someone. You might have to feel the risk of losing the you know disconnection or losing the relationship. You might have to feel that weird passive aggressive thing that happens when, you know, you give someone feedback and they say thank you, but then they don't talk to you for four weeks. Like, I, I don't know what it is, but there's something you may have to feel if you follow through on that action. And if you are willing to feel everything, if you're willing to feel the hurt and the anger and the frustration and the passive aggressiveness and the defensiveness, if you're willing to feel everything, then you can do anything, Mm. right? And so the reason we don't move forward, what closes the gap between what I know and what I do is what I'm willing to feel. You know, if I'm willing to feel, you know, hunger or deprivation, or then I could eat whatever, right? But when I see the ice cream and I see everybody else eating the ice cream, I can't manage that feeling, so I eat the ice cream, right? We can follow through on anything if we're willing to tolerate feelings. And so, you know, one of my big goals in life and what I've worked on for over a decade is how do I increase my capacity to feel? Because if I'm, and by the way, that makes for a much richer life. Like there's all sorts of dysfunctional things we do in order not to feel things, right? There's all sorts of dysfunctional things. We cut people out of our lives and, you know, we, we, uh, you know, we, we get into addictions and we like all sorts of things we do in order to not feel things. So I, I, this, this feels like a very important element to me. So is that emotional courage? Is that the emotional courage that you talk about so often? Yes, that's emotional courage. Emotional courage is the willingness, the courage to experience emotions and not react to shut them down. So how do you like tell us personally how you started to embrace your emotions and some of the things that you've done differently to have more emotional courage? Um, so first of all, I, I, I discovered this. I learned about it as I, uh, a very close friend of mine who I collaborate with. We lead a leadership program together, Jessica Gelson. She was telling me, you got to go meet this woman, Ann Bradney. She's really amazing. She does really amazing work. You got to go to a workshop. So, you know, I kept putting it off because it's like five days uh, and at Esalen, which is, you know, out in California. And I had never been to Esalen and it's, I live in New York and but it somehow it coincided once and I went. And by the way, Esalen's an amazing place. I love Esalen. Uh, one of the most beautiful places I've been. And, and so I'm in this workshop with like 20 other people and people are making these choices. And I, I've, I've done a lot of work. I, I, a lot of personal work. I've done a lot of communications work. I teach communication. I understand this work really, really well. This, this sounds like hubris, but it is rare that I'm ever in a room and stuff's going on and I don't get it. Like in this realm. I mean, that happens mm-hmm. a lot of times, a lot of realms, but in this realm. And, and I, and people are engaging with each other and getting into conflict with each other and, you know, bursting out crying and yelling and like doing all this stuff. And I don't know what's going on. I don't understand the choices that they're making. Like they're making these choices about how to relate to each other that I did not understand. And it was working magic. I mean, people were emerging with like major transformations in their lives. And I emerged from that five days going, I don't know what happened here, but I need to learn more about it. Like this is out of my depths. This is something I've not experienced before. I don't understand and I need to, and, and, and it's very, very powerful. So I need to learn more about it. So I ended up doing a couple more workshops and then she had a school, which she no longer has, but I, I did a four year program with her to become like a practitioner in this work. So I really like in that process, I just it kept every time I did work, every time I met with the group or her process, it was like peeling layers of the onion, like more and more and more stuff. And, and I now run a leadership intensive that I only run once a year and we limit it to 20 people. It's not big, but we do this kind of work. And there are people who come every single time because because it, it like you get better at it and then you realize there's more to get better at. It's hard. It's hard to feel everything in this world. We're, we live in a painful world. We also live in a joyful world. It's a lot of hard 
for people to feel the joy, you know, like we, we, we live in a, a fearful world. I mean, my, my mother was in the Holocaust, right? And so like I grew up with like an experience of everything might be taken away any moment, never be secure, never be comfortable, right? And so you don't want to feel that. So what do you do? You like build stuff. I like make a lot of money and I build a lot of relationships and I do what I can so that I can create some illusion of control and security. And then, you know, you realize like it's an illusion. Like, and, and so you got to feel that. And so every time there's like more and more and more and more to feel, but it's what makes life in my experience, incredibly rich, mm. incredibly rich. The more we're willing to feel, the more of life we're able to experience. So how can bring this like down to the ground level here? Like how can <laughs> I, somebody, how can somebody listening implement emotional courage? Like what should right. they be doing? Very simple. The way you build emotional courage is by exercising your emotional courage. It's mm -hmm. a muscle. You can't build muscles without lifting weights, right? You can't read about muscles. So that's why, like in my book, Lead Leading with Emotional Courage, a lot of it, like at the end of every chapter, it's like practices, like what can you do? So, you know, one of the things that one very, very, pr so because, you, you know, reading a book is, I write a lot of books, Reading a book is great, but that doesn't close the gap between knowledge and action, right? Mm -hmm. It just increases the knowledge. In some cases, it increases the gap because now you know more. But if you're not doing anything, you've just increased the gap. So you have to you have to lift weights if you want to grow muscles. And so the way you build your emotional courage is you do a little thing every day that feels like a risk to you. Mm. If you do something that feels like a risk. I could tell, Hala, by what you've built, that you are comfortable, or maybe not comfortable, but willing to take risks. Mm -hmm. You are willing to take risks. And every time you take a risk, you're expanding your comfort with what you're willing to feel. Because every time you take a risk, there's a possibility of failure. Every time you take a risk, there's a possibility of shame and embarrassment. Every time you take a risk, there's a possibility of confronting your own limitation. Every time you take a risk, there's a possibility of success, which, you know, people might also be afraid of because success brings attention. Not everybody wants attention. Mm -hmm. So like, so the weight and the risks can be small. It could be that you're at dinner and you're with someone who likes to overfeed you. And every time that they offer you something or you're at a guest's house, you know, you're a guest in someone's house. And they offer you something you don't want to say no. And the like, this is actually could feel like a very big risk to just displease another. Like, are you willing to disappoint another person in order to be true to yourself? Mm, that's, like, that's a that's really helpful. important question. Like, and so there are all for all of us, there are ways in which we will lose connection to ourselves in order to stay connected to someone else. So can you take a risk to not give yourself up to please another? And it could be a very small way. It could be a way of saying, you know what? Thank you, but I'm full, right? It could be a way of someone having a conversation with you and saying, you know, I'm sorry, but this is not a conversation I can have right now. Hmm. It could be doing the opposite and saying, look, there's a conversation that we should really have. I mean, it could be putting on a shirt you wouldn't normally wear. Like, you know, it's like any little move that expands your capacity to act that might bring in, that reflects a risk for you that might bring in a feeling. Yeah, I, I guess what I keep thinking is having the courage to not just want to please everyone and please yourself instead. Yeah. So, so yeah. aligning with your decisions and not worrying about how others feel and not worrying about how you feel, doing the right thing, no matter what anyone is feeling, you or somebody else. Yeah, you know, in, in that book, Leading with Emotional Courage, I break it up into four parts, which I consider to be the four elements of leadership. And when I say leadership, I don't just mean big CEOs of big companies. Like leadership is also, you know, like how you lead yourself in the world. And it's, are you confident in yourself, mm -hmm. connected to others, committed to purpose, and emotional courage, emotionally courageous. So it's like, can I, and, and the real challenge is, can I stay connected to you and stay connected to myself at the same time? 
can I, you know, you sort of said, can I stay true to myself and not care what's going on for you? Or, or I, I want to raise a higher bar, which is I might disappoint you, but that doesn't mean I'll disconnect from you. So can mm-hmm. I stay connected to you and connected to myself at the same time? And that's really what we're going for. That has tremendous. And then can I stay connected to you, to myself and to this larger thing I'm committed to in the world? Can I do those three things? That requires a lot of skill and a lot of emotional courage. So I'm so happy you brought this up because I was literally about to bring it up. You have a master class and you talk about the four elements of leadership. So I want to do a quick fire segment. I know we just we covered emotional courage very deeply, so we don't need to go over that one. But I'll rattle off the other three and then just take a minute and give us your best advice for each one. So number one, your first element of powerful leadership is confidence in self. So what is that? How can we be more self-confident? So confident in yourself is not arrogance. It's not, I think I'm better than everybody else. Confidence in self is a groundedness. It's, I I can act, I can, it's not, I know everything. It's, I cannot know things, Mm. right? When someone knows everything, they're not confident, they're insecure. When you're confident, you could be wrong. You cannot know things. You can have a ton of things coming at you from different directions and not lose yourself like to stay centered and grounded in the midst of a lot of noise. That's confidence in yourself. Awesome. Number two, connecting to others. Uh, so what's your best advice in terms of relationships and what does this pillar mean? So being connected to others is being able to see and hear other people and to give them an experience of being seen and heard and to be willing to be seen and heard yourself. That's, that's how we create true connection. Okay, number three, commitment to purpose. So commitment to purpose is much less about big, broad vision, about, you know, I'm, I'm inspiring. I know. It's actually about where you spend your time. Commitment to purpose is like, this comes back to the beginning of our conversation, what I'm gonna spend my time on and what I'm not gonna spend my time on, what I'm gonna do and what I'm not gonna do. And the people who are really effective at commitment to purpose are very focused on what they're gonna do. And there's, by the way, I'll just say that on, on our website, there's an assessment that's free that has 48 questions. It takes, you know, five or 10 minutes to fill out, but it tells you, and it's related to the chapters of the book, but it tells you, you know, are, where your strengths and weaknesses are in confidence and self connection to others, commitment to purpose and emotional courage. So it gives you an idea. I mean, we originally thought of it as, you know, where to jump into the book, but it's also just a generally kind of interesting thing to say, where do I jump in? You know, and that's to, a, the leadership gap assessment. Yes, is that what you're referring to? OK, cool. That's I have it. the link here. I'll put it in my show notes. Uh, so we'll have that for our audience. OK, let's talk about your new book that's coming out this Wednesday. You can change other people. The four steps to help your colleagues, employees, even family up their game. Why did you write this book and what is your pers- uh, what is your definition of change in this context? Great question. So I wrote the book actually because my co-author Howie came back, came up to me after one of my coach trainings that I do. And, and I had said in that coach training, this is going to be my last coach training. And he came up to me and he goes, it can't be your last coach training. And I said, yeah, but it kind of is. And he, and he's, he's been to a, he, he came to, he's a close friend of mine and he came to as many of them as he, as he could. And he said, and basically that conversation ended up in a, there's really important stuff here. Let's write a book about it. Um, and let's, and let's make this book incredibly user manual like, meaning it's not a conceptual book. It's filled with dialogues. There's a great parenting book that I love called how to speak. So your kids will listen and listen. So your kids will speak. And, and I, I, it was a great idea. It was a great book and it was executed really well. There were like cartoons in it and dialogues and it told me exactly what to say and how to say it. And I was like, okay, so if we write this, I want it to be that straightforward and easy. And it is not a book about manipulation. It's not a book that says, how can I say the magic words to change you, Hala? So you don't even realize it, but you start doing like, I'm hypnotizing you. (laughs) It's not that. It's, it's that, you know, everybody says you can't change other people. You can only change yourself. Totally not true. Totally not true. You will not be an effective leader if you can't change other people. Your job as a leader, your job as a manager is to align people. You're changing them. You want to change their focus. You want, and you're not going to do it in a way that they don't want to change. 
So the conversation has to be open with them. Like you're going to support them in changing and you're going to help them. But, you know, the first step in, in how, you know, changing other people is to be an ally versus a critic. A lot of times we approach it as a critic. You're not doing this. I want you to do that. Feedback has been incredibly damaging in, in our, in our cultures because it's like, as long as I give you feet, especially with, you know, books that kind of support this, like, you know, ruthlessly telling you the truth because it brings people to shame, but it doesn't actually help what we want. I don't need people to know the truth. I just need them to get better, right? I want them to up their game. And telling them the truth may be a part of that, but it's not just about dropping a truth bomb. It's about having the skills to help people improve their performance. It's about having the skills to help people you know, take risks, take, have the emotional courage, take risks to do things differently than they're doing in order to get better results than they were having beforehand. And that's what the book is about. The book is very specifically about how do I become an ally instead of a critic to the people closest to me that I want to help change who want to change themselves and may be stuck and struggling. Yeah. Let's talk about some of those strategies, because when people get told negative feedback first instinct is to get super defensive you exactly. or even resist it you're just like i don't want to listen to you you don't know anything about me 100%. You don't, you're not with me 100 percent of the time how dare you tell me any of those things about myself and even when you're uh, you know your own self you can have those uh feelings even if you know that that something you're doing is wrong you'll, you'll be resistant to that change so how do we switch that dynamic okay so first can i tell you why we respond that way because yeah, it's a very short thing of why. So the most, we talked about emotional courage, the most painful feeling that we can have as human beings emotionally is shame, right? Mm. Shame is like, there's something about me that's wrong. Like there's something about me that's not right. Like not just I do something that bothers other people, that sort of might be embarrassing, but shame is the place where it's like, and we will do anything not to feel shame, right? Mm -hmm. Because it's so painful. So what you just mentioned, you, you nailed it, Hala. You mentioned the top two things we do to avoid shame, which is denial and defensiveness. Like the easiest way not to have shame is to completely be blind to this thing you're talking about that, that I feel shame about. You think I talk too much? No, I don't, I don't see it. I don't see, I don't see it at all. That's ridiculous. No one else has told me that or everyone who has told me that doesn't know me well enough or whatever. Right? So if I deny this, what you're saying, if, and, if, and that's how things become blind spots, things become blind spots because they're too painful to look at. Right? So people are being difficult when they're being going into defensiveness or now they literally don't see it. When I have someone who tells me, I know what my blind spots are. My answer is no, you don't <laughs> like that's the definition of a blind spot. You don't know what your blind spots are. Like you might know things that were blind spots. But so so that's why we go into shame. So the way and 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 now let me flip to the other side of what does it take to make a change? It takes four things. Ownership, independent capability, emotional courage and future proofing resilience to change in, in multiple situations in the past. So when we just give someone feedback and we tell them what to do differently or tell them what the problem is, they don't have any ownership. They're not going to build any independent capability. They will need a tremendous amount of emotional courage to survive that kind of shame. And they are not resilient in any way to change in the future because we've just corrected their action in this particular situation in a way that drives them to deny it in the first place anyway. So that's what doesn't work. So when we talk about in this book, the four steps, they are four steps to build ownership, independent capability, emotional courage, and future proofing. And the first one is to go from critic to ally. So that's the first step. And the way you do that is, and we have a three-part formula, which is empathize, express confidence, and offer to help, right? Ask permission, right? Because it's your choice. So if I see something and I'll say, hello, you know, I've noticed this thing, um, I know because I've seen it, I've seen you be incredibly capable in this past. I know absolutely that you can handle this situation. Um, would you be interested in thinking about it together? Now you might say, no, I'm not interested in thinking about it together. In which case I, I say, okay, you know, and, and I have to be okay with that. But when I say, okay, you now have a much 
greater chance and likelihood of coming back to me for help because you know I will respect that boundary. And that then it will be your ownership. And also chances are you might say, yeah, I would love help thinking it through. I'll think it through with you. There's no cost to thinking it through. And then we begin to think together. And my job is not to give you advice. It's not to tell you what to do or tell you stories about how I did it before, right? That would be taking the ownership back. My job is then to go to step two, which is what is the outcome you want. But, but that's, the, that's that first piece that allows you to sidestep the denial and defensiveness. Yeah, because permission is so important. I mean, I've gotten feedback before when I didn't ask for it from people who weren't my manager or my direct or anywhere on the chain above me. And it can come off honestly rude and, and you don't process that feedback well because you right. just feel like, well, who are you to tell me anything? And why do you even think that you should tell me anything? How can we like, I guess, how do we make sure that we give people permission before we give them feedback? And then how can we also separate bad feedback from good feedback? Because if I had listened to everything my cousins told me or my ex-boyfriend told me, I would not be where I am today if I listened to that feedback. Right, exactly. I I, I think, look, I collect feedback as part of my coaching. Like I, I collect feedback, but I actually think feedback does more damage than good. I, because and, and I was talking with a client who said, I'm going to write an article about this. I was talking to a client who said, you know, we're thinking about rolling out this whole feedback thing and sending people this book on feedback, et cetera. And I said, and this is the second question in the, in the four step process. Um, what is the outcome you want? Like, what's the outcome you want? Like, and, and he said, well, the outcome I want is I want huh, let me think about that. Because his initial thought was, well, feedback is going to like make everybody better, right? But it's like, no, actually, feedback is not going to make everybody better. It's probably going to make them get along less well. It probably will be unskillfully executed. It's going to make them feel shame and dislike each other more and probably more resistant. So Mm -hmm. what's the outcome you want? Well, the outcome I want is for people to perform better and to work better together. Okay, well, if that's the outcome you want, then feedback is going to do the opposite of that outcome. So what's going to give you that outcome, which is you have to help people get skilled in supporting each other's performance. Like the goal is how do you help people get better at helping each other? That's sort of why I wrote the book. I mean, that's what the book is about. How do you help people help each other get better? And it is not by just willy nilly telling them what you think. Right. And so if you're so so one of the things is, uh, you know, if you give people the same language, then they're going to have the same conversation. So if you know how to ask permission, then then people will, you know, if you sort of say in your company, let's say you just say, okay, here's how we're doing this. I read Peter Bregman's book. There's a three part formula. You know, if if like we're going to focus and develop on supporting each other's success and performance, not just telling them the truth or giving them feedback. So how do you do that? The first thing is you need permission. If you see something that you wanna help, then you, and by the way, if you don't have confidence that they can change, don't go to them in the first place, you're wasting your time, right? But if you have confidence in them, then you can share what you're seeing and, and express that confidence and then ask them if they want to think it through with you. And if they say no, you got to respect that. Then, then it's a no. And if it's a yes, then you go to the next step, which is, you know, so what wait, is wait, this is the, per- this is the permission formula, right? Can you right. just exactly. pull it? What is yeah. that exactly? So this is the permission of the formula. The permission formula is, you know, empathize, express confidence and ask permission. Um, and, and be willing to accept a no. Even by the way, if you're doing that with one of your employees, so right. let's talk about like a family member. Exactly. You want to give a family member or a best friend you know advice because it's uh, way easier when you're a manager. Yeah, way easier. And, and by the way, when you're a parent, you think you have the right, but you don't like that's 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 uh, um, that's false. That's an illusion. You don't have control over your kids. Um, I mean, I'm telling you that from my experience as a parent. Um, you don't have control. So you still need permission when you're in a family. And by the way, I'll tell you something interesting, which is we sent out a survey to our list. You know, I have a list of whatever, 60,000 people. And we said, you know, does this idea interest you? You know, would you want to read about it? And also, 
who in your life comes to mind when you want to change? And we, you know, there's a lot of executives on that list. There's a lot of leaders on that list. Like most of them, the number one person, I mean, this is a business book and it's also written for personal, you know, like you could use it, et cetera, but I'm like a business guy. And almost everybody was like a family member. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Like that's like, so it's on people's minds a lot. So the way to do it, and I'll just give you an example. Okay. My daughter, I saw my daughter uh, um, who in the, I, I saw her in the morning. Uh, this is my older daughter who's in college and I saw her in the morning and she was eating for breakfast a chocolate chip cookie. And, and she looked up at me and she had this like a little bit of shame, you know, <laughs> guilt, guilt look. And she's like, yeah, I couldn't sleep last night. I was doing work. So I stayed up till four in the morning and I baked all these chocolate chip cookies and they're really good. And I was like, Oh, are there any left? And she's like, well, this is the last one, right? (laughs) Like it's not a good scene. And I was like, huh? Um, okay. You seem not so happy about that. Like you, that's that's emphasize, that's empathize, right? That's empathize, that's empathy. But it's also, by the way, I'm not coming to her saying you have a problem or I have a problem with you eating those cookies. I'm saying, do you have a problem with that? Because Mm -hmm. if you're perfectly happy eating all these cookies, then I'm going to back off, right? Because you're not going to want to change, right? And it's not on me to make you change in that way. So my first is like, you seem not so happy about that. She's like, it's not my better moment. Like, I'm not so happy about it. And then I say, well, I've seen you not do that. Like I've seen you not stay up all night and bake a bunch of cookies and eat them all. And by the way, your cookies are great. So if, if I were up at four in the morning with your fresh baked cookies, I would eat them all too. So like, I get it. No shame in that. Right. But I I know that you're able to act differently. And do you want to, would it be helpful if we thought about it together? Right. Mm -hmm. Um, so that's the formula, right? Like you don't seem so happy about this. I, I know that you can make a different choice if you want to and, and handle it differently. And I know it's not easy, right? I know it's not just, Oh, you should have just not eaten it. Right. That's a dumb thing to say. She knows she shouldn't have not, she should have not eaten it. Like, like, you know, stating the obvious is a typical critic move. Like, Mm -hmm. Oh wow. You really shouldn't put your finger in that socket if you don't want to get electrocuted. Thanks. You know? (laughs) Um, so, so to say like, I know, and I know it's hard. It's not, it's not just a decision. It's hard. And do you want to think about it? So that's the formula. In that moment, she said, no, I don't want to think about it right now. And I said, okay, no problem. And I said, if you ever do, I'm, you know, I I am not unfamiliar with this challenge myself. And I'm really happy to think it through with you. And that was the end of that conversation. That was the end of that conversation. And later on, a few days later, after she did the same thing, then she comes to me and says, hey, can we, let's, can we, I, I, like, she sort of said, stop when I tell you to stop, okay? And I'm like, okay, but like, can we talk about it? But if I don't want to talk about it anymore, I'm going to say stop. I'm like, that is, always, you are always in control of this conversation. Like, you will be in control of this conversation. Like, I am here in support of what you want and you, it's not my agenda. Yeah, right? I think this is we, a great formula for us to to give feedback without it being taken in the wrong way because it could just easily just escalate a problem rather than fix the problem. So let's talk about the hidden opportunity and everything and why that's important and and why we need to think about the outcome of what we want people to achieve when it comes to them changing. Yeah. So people get stuck in their problems. You know, their problem is I, I, I eat too many chocolate chip cookies. So the way you solve that problem is stop eating so many chocolate chip cookies. Right. But, but really, if you say, what's the outcome you want? I want to feel active and healthy. I want to be an athlete. Like I want to be an athlete. Well, being an athlete is super more exciting and engaging and enthusiastic than not eating chocolate chip cookies, right? Mm. Like not eating chocolate chip cookies, by the way, is very narrow. So maybe I'll say, well, not eating unhealthy food, but that still is like weighty and unfun. 
but being an athlete is like an outcome she could get behind. And she is an athlete. So it's like, okay, I want to be an athlete. Well, what do you want to do with an athlete? I want to be able to like figure skate and jump and, and you know, do a, I can't remember what the name is, but she spins around three times. Like, I want to do that. <laughs> Great. Well, to do a triple that, axle. Yeah, triple axle. Thank you. <laughs> I should know that. She's a, she's a figure skater. I watch all of her stuff, but I don't remember the names. Um, and so it's like, great. Well, to do that, you need a, a um, very favorable strength to weight ratio, right? Because if you're strong compared to your weight, you can get up higher. You could jump higher. So, so is that, you know, like, and so now, like, we've got an outcome that's sort of more interesting. Then the hidden opportunity is in every problem, there's, there's like, where is, let's like go back to the problem because it's still a problem. Eating chocolate chip cookies in the middle of the night is still a problem, Right. So just because we found another outcome doesn't necessarily solve that problem. So now let's go back to the problem, but solve it in a way that sees there's actually an opportunity in this that gets me to my, uh, to my outcome. So what's the opportunity? Well, the opportunity is, um, the, the, the problem is I'm eating chocolate chip cookies at four o'clock in the morning. The reason I'm doing that is because my, uh, discipline and willpower is exhausted at four o'clock in the morning. And in fact, I'm exhausted at four o'clock in the morning. And in fact, the, the, uh, the thing that chocolate chip cookies do is wake me up when I'm exhausted. So actually the opportunity here is to solve for the problem that's leading me to eat chocolate chip cookies in the first place, which is I'm exhausted. And my, the problem I'm now solving for the opportunity in this problem is I need more rest which by the way will help me become a better athlete in more ways than one. I am, I'm tiring myself. I'm going to bed too late. I'm working too hard. I am exhausting myself. And so now, now we're like, okay, so how do we, now we're in a, in a really great feedback conversation, right? I mean, sorry, a non-feedback conversation, but a supportive coaching conversation, which says, Hey dad, how can I incorporate more rest in my life? So I'm not up at four o'clock in the morning eating, but really so that I become this kind of athlete that I want to be, right? How can mm -hmm. I be this athlete that I want to be by getting more rest? So now I'm not just giving her feedback that says, stop eating chocolate chip cookies. Now we're in this conversation about improving her performance by getting rest so that she could be an athlete. You know, do you see how that's two totally different 100%. conversations, right? And one is much more likely to succeed. And that's the, that's like when I say you can change other people in the, the, that book, that's the magic of that book in a sense, which is, I don't want to teach you to be more honest with people. I, I, I'm not saying honesty is bad, but I want to teach you, help them achieve and get to the things that they want to achieve. Because for you as a leader of 63 people, for me as a coach, for as in our family members, that's what we want. That's the outcome we want is we want to help people to improve their performance. Yeah, I think this book is great. I think it's very needed. So it's coming out. This this podcast episode is going to come out in a month or so. So your book will yeah, have already been out. out. So uh, yeah. where can people go find your book? So, you know, first of all, to find out anything, you can always go to BregmanPartners.com. All my books are on there. B-R-E-G-M-A-N Partners.com. And then the book will be hopefully wherever books are sold, but certainly, you know, it's on Amazon and, you know, all the, you know, all the online booksellers and, and uh, uh, it's out there. Cool. So that's again, it's called You Can Change Other People by Peter Bregman. And the last question I ask all my guests is what is your secret to profiting in life? Um, uh, that's a, that's, that's like the doorknob question in therapy, right? You know, like, uh, Oh, we're about <laughs> to leave. It's a great session. By the way, I have this like overwhelming life issue that I'm going to try to share with you. So that's the doorknob question. I, uh, I'll share a very quick story, which is that my father died in uh, April of 2020 mm. and, uh, and I, you know, drove out to, I w it was in the middle of COVID and he was in Florida and I was in New York. And so I drove with my brother. 20 something hours, basically nonstop. Um, and he died about an hour before we got there. Mm -hmm. Uh, and I, and I got there and I, um, I kind of wanted to see him. And I, so I, and I asked them to keep him in the apartment until we got there before they, you know, took him out. And, um, and I, I, I it's so ingrained in my head. They took the sheet up from over his head 
And I saw my father, who I've known obviously my whole life and was a sweet, sweet man. And, and I saw his body, which was lifeless and clearly and obviously lifeless. And, you know, everybody says this, but it is so, it like really, really hit me. Like you cannot take anything with you. Like when we die, we die. Like that's it. So then the question is, what makes a difference? And then I, uh, uh, you know, about a week ago, I was playing Monopoly with my kids and, um, and it struck me. And I've only played Monopoly a few times in my adult life, but it struck me, wow, life really is like Monopoly. Like you're playing this game and you're making a ton of money and it's fake, but you get by hotels and things like that. And you could, and you get totally competitive and you could totally, you know, like I, I, you know, you could win, you could definitely win. And it's, and like, we could totally focus that on life. But in the end you close the board and you put the money back into the you know little plastic container and you shut it and then the question is what was important about that game like what was the most important thing about that monopoly game and yes the competition and the fun and all of that but it's like did I enjoy my time with the people I was playing with? Like, did we have fun? Were we engaged? Did I put myself in it, but in a way that like enhanced our relationship instead of storming away saying you cheated and blah, blah, you know? Like, was it fun? Was I connected with those people? Like, that is the only thing that matters after a game of Monopoly. It doesn't matter who won, right? It's meaningless who won. And I, to me, I think profiting in life is, you know, playing your life like you would play a really successful game of Monopoly, which is like throw yourself in it, have fun, you know, be competitive if you want to, engage with each other, but make sure that when you walk away from that board, you can look back and go, that was great. That was really fun. I love the people I just played with and it, you know, I'm super happy I just spent that last couple hours. That is such a powerful story. I relate to it so much. I actually lost my dad very close to when you lost yours, May oh, 2020 during COVID. And same no, thing, sorry. we got to the hospital be, uh, right after he died and we missed it. And we weren't allowed to go to the hospital, which was like so tough. Yeah, and then they only yeah. let us go afterwards. And to your point, it's like you see them lifeless, these people that were once full of life and you realize life is limitless you got to your point we talked about it earlier there's a time limit we need to know our priorities we need to know what we're doing but i never thought about it in the way that you just mentioned that we need to also have fun be engaged be connected it's not just about winning this monopoly game it's about enjoying the journey so right. really powerful i love that um peter this was an amazing conversation thank you for you know running over a bit i'm glad that we got to you know continue talking where can our listeners go to learn more about you and everything that you do uh, so the best place is bregmanpartners.com b-r-e-g-m-a-n-p-a-r-t-n-e-r-s.com awesome thank you hello thank you so much thanks for listening to young and profiting podcast if you enjoyed the show please write us a review or comment on your favorite platform Nothing makes us happier than reading your reviews. We'd love to hear what you think about the show. And don't forget to share this podcast with your friends, family, and on social media. I always repost, reshare, and support those who support us. You can find me on Instagram at Yap with Hala or LinkedIn. Just search for my name. It's Hala Taha. Big thanks to the Yap team as always. This is Hala signing off. <laughs>